Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to uh, uh, take this opportunity, first of all, to welcome you to uh, one of our first uh, webinars uh, hosted by Northwestern University Center for Public Safety and uh, our Northwestern University Center for Public Safety Ambassador Program. Uh, these are part of our graduates in the program that assisted us greatly in putting this together for you. I see a large list of people that have applied uh, that are sitting in. And I hope this is gonna be the first of many webinars we do. This is a big topic. And I think we're just gonna kind of touch the top of the iceberg, but at least hopefully getting professionals thinking uh, in a similar direction. Uh, we are fortunate today to have some really excellent participants. But before I get to that, I would like to just uh, have our director of the Center for Public Safety add her welcome uh, to you, and then we'll uh, get on with our program. Shelley? Thanks, Ron. I just wanted to welcome everybody here. I want to thank you for stopping by to seeing what we have to say. I think we've got three great presenters here for you today. And we're going to be taking a video or a, we're going to record this presentation. Um, if there are things you want to revisit later, um, we will have that available. But thank you all for coming out. Um, we hope you find this valuable and I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, first of all, I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Cameron Fisher. I go by Ron, uh, and I serve as a senior instructor and uh, director of development uh, for the center. All that said, let's get started. We have three speakers uh, today. The first one that will speak is Ryan Durbin. He's a lieutenant with the Washington State Patrol. He currently authored a very interesting article in Police Chief Magazine called data-driven diversity. And, uh, and I think that what I'd like him to talk about is what drove him kind of to the article, things he learned, things he can share with the rest of us. Our second speaker uh, will be Sandra Malin. Uh, she is the executive director of early college opportunities at, Waukes at Waukesha County Technical College. Uh, Sandra is kind of a brainchild in getting young high school kids interested in public service and uh, her thoughts, and also quite bluntly, her success story in getting this program moving forward. Our last speaker will be Jody Crozier, and she's the Associate Dean uh, of Recruitment Academy and Criminal Justice at Waukesha County Technical College. Uh, Jody is a client and kind of a receiver of this program, but put it together uh, where we see high school seniors uh, stepping in to a community college or senior year, earning a number of college credits in the public service arena and getting them th thinking early on about the positives of being uh, in law enforcement and public service. That said, uh, Ryan, I'll turn the floor over to you and uh, we'll move forward. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Before I start, I'll give a little bit of uh, background for me because that kind of helps explain why I got interested in law enforcement recruitment. Uh, so I began my career back in 2005. And for those in law enforcement, that was still a competitive time. So to be considered for law enforcement, you were competing against hundreds of applicants, uh, which is not really the case uh, in a lot of jurisdictions today. Uh, after I was hired, I promoted uh, 2013 eventually became the sergeant of our academy. And what I found at the academy was very interesting to me, um, the varied background of all of the different recruits that were joining the state patrol. And I was always curious and would have conversations with the cadets, you know, what got them interested in law enforcement? What was their background? And it was uh, very varied as far as what drove them to law enforcement. So that kind of piqued my curiosity. And at the academy, I had, a, for the first time ever, a day shift schedule. And so I started going back to school, which uh, ultimately led me into getting my doctorate, which I did my doctoral study on the recruitment and retention for female minority police candidates. And in that process, uh, as a very detailed process, but I did a lot of literature review, reading books and articles uh, about recruitment in general, and then specifically to law enforcement. I did in-depth interviews with our candidates to the Washington State Patrol, did a couple of focus groups, with all, all of our recruiters and then more interviews with our executive staff to really understand what it is in our agency, 
um, to recruit people. And then locally in our state, the challenges that, that exist. And that's really uh, using all that information in my academic experience and law enforcement experience, uh, wrote the article that Ron mentioned there in the IACP. And so briefly to kind of go into that article and some of the takeaways for the group that you would have is, you know, it is becoming much more challenging to recruit into law enforcement. And that's probably why we have such a large audience today. And so how do we better leverage technology and use data to help uh, maximize the resources that we have to make the next generation interested in law enforcement? And so the first step that I would encourage folks to do is to benchmark what you're currently doing in your agency. Uh, you, if you're going to institute any kind of changes, you want to understand what you're currently doing and what those results have been, because as you start to make changes, you need to be able to measure against that to know was that a positive change or did that actually hurt what you were um, doing and what methods you're seeing. So what are you currently doing? It's important to get together across your agency, if it's a large agency, even if it's a smaller agency, to figure out what has been done historically and what you're doing currently, and then what can you actually measure and what kind of data are you collecting? Uh, then with your agency setting goals, and when we talk about goal setting, um, the acronym of SMART goals, um, I use in the article a smarter uh, goal setting uh, mechanism, which is to be specific, measurable, make sure that what you're wanting to achieve is actually attainable, that it's relevant, uh, it's time bound, it's engaging, and it's gonna be rewarding. And we talk about rewarding, not just for the agency or for the recruiters, but for the candidates themselves. We wanna make sure that we're mirroring and matching what the candidate wants to have in a profession with what it is you have to offer as an employer. Uh, it doesn't do you really any good to recruit somebody to your agency if as soon as they start doing the job, they realize they don't want to do this job. So we want to mirror what their expectations are with what reality will be when they get there. Um, as an agency, if you're going to set diversity goals, uh, there's a very key aspect in setting uh, and explaining the why to your staff and to candidates. Why are you trying to get this diversity? And what, is, what do you mean when you say the term diversity? If it is to increase the number of female applicants that you have, explain to your agency and to those in your community, what's the benefit of having a larger female population in law enforcement? And there's lots of studies and research that can help uh, e explain that. You have lower levels of use of force. You have better advocacy in a lot of domestic violence cases. There's a whole host of reasons but understanding the why diversity is important to your agency and to your community is something that's gonna be very meaningful as you move forward in your uh, recruitment plan. So in creating your goals, um, make sure you understand the why as an agency, but also what that means to your local community. And that's gonna help as you move forward to develop your recruitment plan. A critical aspect in developing any kind of a recruitment plan is to also build into your plan a data collection plan so that you understand what it is metric wise that you want to collect as you deploy your plan. So understanding what types of things you're going to measure, um, what kind of computer systems you may be able to use, um, mapping things out in the article, I give an illustration of a heat map and understanding you know, where a recruiter event is and does that correlate then with increased candidate applicants in a certain location? That can help you better deploy your resources. If you continue to show up to certain events and that never generates any applications, then you need to adjust and leverage your resources in a different way. Um, but that really comes down to your data collection plan and making sure that what data you're collecting is actually gonna be useful as you move forward. And we talk about data collection, also understand that you also need to uh, build into your process a way to evaluate your recruiter performance. Um, not all recruiters are created equal. There's some recruiters that are going to far exceed uh, expectations, and there's some other recruiters that might need additional training and some support systems to help encourage them to get out and to do the new types of things that you're going to innovate and try. Uh, a key component of any plan is the messaging. And a lot of agencies, when I was doing my research, they rely on a marketing company or an outside firm to really generate that message and control all of the marketing plans. 
yeah, I think that's a mistake and you should really develop your local message based upon what is meaningful for your, your local community. And a way to understand what is that message to craft that is to interview your applicants. As you are receiving applicants and people that want to join your agency, asking them, hey, why are you interested in our agency as opposed to other agencies? That can be very helpful data. Even if you don't end up hiring them, you can understand what the perspective is of applicants to your specific agency, and you can use that to craft your message. Um, but don't rely on a third party marketing firm to create that message. It needs to be meaningful. It needs to be relevant to what your agency is and reflect what the, the values are of your agency. Um, using your historical data and hopefully the data that you're going to start collecting, that's how you can adjust your marketing strategy and understand that that might take change over time, different times of the year. If you're uh, using marketing along with different sporting events, you're going to have different um, penetration into the market with different demographics. So understand that it, it's something that's going to be ongoing. And the more you can aggregate down into your data, you can help understand that advertising for a certain channel at certain points of the year might get you different applicants. Um, but again, that goes to the, the level and detail and specificity of your data as you're collecting it. And then that leads me to my last point before I turn it over is that you need to have a meaningful opportunity to analyze and review your plan and correlate what your plan is, uh, what you hope to achieve to what the data is showing that you're achieving and be flexible to adapt that and to make changes to it. And uh, I'll gladly answer questions at the end, but I'll turn it back over to Ron. Okay. Uh... Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, also, uh, as we open this up for questions at the end, uh, we will be sending out a blast where you will be able to respond to uh, the speakers will respond to your questions by email uh, in the future as well. So that's very kind of them to do that. Uh, with that said, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Sandra Malin, Executive Director of Early College Opportunities, Waukesha uh, County Technical College. Well, thank you, Ron. Happy to be here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, a method of recruitment that we have at WCTC that attracts high school students to, um, you know, areas of their interest uh, while they're still in high school. So I was hired nine years ago at uh, Waukesha County Technical College because the college had this idea about making uh, use of a high school senior um, senior, senior year. Oftentimes, and I know this was true for me too, and you might remember yourself, when you were a senior in high school, many of your required classes were met and you spent a lot of that time taking electives. Maybe it's some of those electives that you didn't necessarily want to take, but just had to fill your schedule. Also, oftentimes seniors have early release from high school to work, but that work that they're doing isn't necessarily advancing them in any kind of career or giving them any kind of career exploration. It's really just, you know, a part-time job. Um, so we wanted to provide an opportunity for high school seniors to have an immersion experience um, in an area in which they have a clear career choice. And while they're doing that during their senior year, they're earning both college credit and high school credit for those same courses that they're taking. So that's when the Dual Enrollment Academy was formed. And the students who are in the Dual Enrollment Academy are on our campus for a full year, uh, typically their senior year, but in the last couple of years, we've, all, we've also opened it up to juniors. And so students are going to be on our campus Monday through Friday from eight to noon. And it's a cohort-based model, which means that all of the students who are taking these college classes are all high school students. They come from various high schools, um, but they all have the same career interest in mind. So they might start or they will start the year not knowing each other, but they, they, they form really strong bonds because they all have the same goals and interests, in this case, in the criminal justice area. And so they support each other throughout the year. And, um, you know, it really becomes a, a positive experience for that, for them in that way as well. Like I said, they're taking college courses in the program. They're the same courses that any traditional college student would be taking, same expectations, same learning outcomes, oftentimes even the same instructor. And, um, and so we have 
right now in our dual enrollment academies, we have 10 academies, one of which is criminal justice. When we started this uh, 10, 10 years ago, we had 40 students from three high schools. This coming year, we're going to have 255 students throughout our 10 academies, and they come from about 26 different high schools. So the academies have grown through the years to have a very um, prestigious reputation. Students want to be in these programs and not everybody who applies actually gets in. The demand is so high. We have a limited number of seats and Jody's gonna talk a little bit further about how she selects the students for the criminal justice programs. But they really gained a really good reputation that students start preparing to apply to the academy early on in their high school career. How are they gonna prepare? Well, first of all, they need to make sure that they maintain a good GPA uh, because that's one of the things that we will consider when looking at our applicants. They also want to um, maybe double up on some of their required courses in the first three years of high school so that when they do get to the academies in their senior year, they don't have other high school class obligations that they need to take or maybe just you know one class that they need. And then also they can start getting some outside experience in this area. So for example, maybe they want to join a local explorer program that they have. All of these um, experiences that they have, a higher GPA, being more prepared, will definitely rise their application to the top and just draw a better um, you know, student cohort for us um, and ultimately for you when they, when they finish the program. We have the advantage of having 12 public school districts in our county. And so students who come to WCTC, the longest drive that they're going to have is about 30 minutes. However, we, and we only market to um, the public schools in our county. However, we are getting applicants from both private schools and schools outside of our county as well who are hearing about our program. Um, some school districts, we have three school districts in our county that do provide busing for students to come to WCTC every day. They bring them here in the morning, they pick them up at noon um, and bring them back to their district in the afternoon. Um, but most students need to be able to provide their own transportation to come here. So how did we get this um, up and running over the last 10 years and make it so popular? A big part of that is the partnerships that we have with our high schools. So, um, our public schools in Waukesha County, as I mentioned, we have 12 of them. They, uh, we have developed uh, an advisory council and these advisory members are appointed by the superintendents of every school district, typically two people per district. Um, and those individuals are, are usually uh, career and technical education coordinators and directors of secondary um, curriculum. So, we hold meetings with them three times a year and they really do um, support our programming and they really are the decision makers in the academies that we offer. So when we are considering offering a new academy, um, you know, we put it out to, to them. We have them review the courses. We talk about, you know, the labor market, uh, job expectations, salary expectations. They look at their school district. They, you know, consider is there a need for this that our, our district can't offer? And when the answer is yes, they support the academies and the school districts pay for the students to be in the academies. Um, we, and, and so then the next question is how do we get students here and how do we make this known to students? Well, first of all, we've been around doing this for 10 years. So word is out. Um, it's been very successful. We continue to add academies practically every year. Um, parents are sending all of their kids year after year. We have one parent who's had four, four of their kids go through um, various academies um, during the school year or over the school years. Um, but really it is about the schools and that's why the partnership with the school districts is so important because the first line of the student typically hearing about the academies, if not from a sibling or from maybe an older student that they know about who did it um, or a parent, it's going to be from their high school counselor. 
So really establishing that relationship with the counselors and letting the counselors know the opportunities that are out there. And one of the things that our office does is you know, communicate with counselors very regularly. They know how to, how to have that conversation with students about the academies, what the expectation is, the rigor, um, all of that, and then how to apply. Another thing that the counselors are really good at, and also the members of our um, High School Partnership Advisory Committee, is working with um, the Dual Enrollment Academy coordinator in our office to schedule time in the schools to let the students know about the academies. So the year before students are to be in an academy, we're going to be in the school district in December and January to talk to the students about the dual enrollment academies. And we're not there to sell it, we're there to inform them about what it is and give them just enough information to, to let them know that if this is something that you want to learn more about, bring your parent uh, to an information night that we hold in February. So December, January, we're out in the school districts talking directly to the students about the opportunity for the academies, about the expectations, what it takes to be in an academy. And then if you want to learn more about it, come to our information nights on our campus in February, bring a parent, and we're going to tell you even more detail about it. Um, and then on in February, when we have those, and by the way, we, you, we book the room that we also use for our annual graduation ceremonies, and we fill that space two times a month in the month of February with students and parents who want to learn more about, about these. Year over year over year, um, we're filling this space to capacity. So it's super, super popular, um, really a great option for students, but parents also get really excited about it. Um, oftentimes the parents are saying that they never saw their kid actually like take the lead in their further education before. And for their, their, for their son or daughter to come to them and say, you know, come to this with me, I wanna learn more about it and I wanna do this when I'm a senior, really gets the parent engaged as well to say, wow, my kid never like expressed an interest in, in anything like this before. So it really has been rewarding to get that feedback from the parents too, that the students are all of a sudden like re-excited about their school year. And to think about it, like the students are putting themselves out there during their senior year when they could have an easy senior year, um, but instead they're willing to be a new student in a new school on a different campus during their senior year and try something different really speaks to the character of the students who are who are doing this. Um, so after, um, after those information nights, they are to apply to the program by March 1st. Um, and Jody will explain after the applications come, like what she does to, because Jody is our associate dean, is really the one who chooses who the students are going to be. I'm going to take a chance here and just share my screen and make sure that I'm able to do that. Yep. Okay. And I just want to show you for the criminal justice studies program, the courses that the students will be taking. So um, in the criminal justice is the 30 credit program. So they're going to be taking 15 credits in the fall semester and 15 credits in the spring semester. And, um, you know, these are all courses that are in our 60 credit associate degree. So it really is giving the students an opportunity to get a jump start on their education prior to finishing high school. Uh, they're going to be halfway done with their associate degree by the time they graduate from high school. And ideally, they will stay with us and finish what they started um, right after high school. They will already be familiar with our campus. They're already familiar with our processes. And it's just a very easy transition for them to just continue that second year. Um, and that's all I have. It's, so with that, I guess I will turn it over to uh, Ron to turn it over to Jody, I guess. Sandra, thank you so much. Um, quite a curriculum. Uh, Jody, I'll turn the floor over to you, Associate Dean, Recruit the Academy, Criminal Justice, Law Enforcement, Wa Waukesha County Technical College. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so glad I'm able to talk about our dual enrollment program because I'm so passionate about it. I'm so 
grateful that uh, for Sandra's leadership because she's made it so big over the last several years. So a couple of years ago, uh, this was brought to our attention and they said, we don't have one for criminal justice. Let's do one for CJ. So I said, fantastic. But somebody thought, let's do a, a, a joint with fire. So our first year we did a, a fire and law enforcement, which did not work because the fire kids didn't want to be cops and the law enforcement kids didn't want to be firefighters. So um, lessons learned, we tried the next year, uh, which was last year and it went great. Um, the students were really engaged. It went fantastic. My goal with dual enrollment is to bring them back. I want them all, all those students to come back into our social degree program. My, my goal is 100%. Um, we didn't make 100%. Some decided to go to four years uh, institutions. Some decided to go into the military. Uh, but they all had a fantastic experience and they got one free year of college. So um, the, the high schools have to pay for it. So they get that free year of college. Like Sandra said, it's the same rigor as our associate degree program. We have the same attendance policy. Um, they have uniform requirements. So we tell them early on in the process that this is not going to be like high school where you can show up tardy and not have your ID it's not quite to the level our police academy, um, but we do have expectations of them. They are college students and we expect uh, the same behaviors um, of college students. So um, one of the things we do um, to decide who's going to be in, because we only have a limited um, number of spots we can take, we're actually taking 28 this year, which is a lot of high school seniors for one instructor. So um, uh, what we did is we did interviews. So we brought them all in. We told them, dress like you're coming for a job interview, be ready. Um, and I was absolutely blown away by the level of professionalism. Some of them developed resumes. Um, these are varsity sport captains on their high school teams, 4.0 students, um, students who will not have an opportunity to get free college uh, for one year. Um, they were just so passionate. I mean, I'm so thrilled with if that's the future of law enforcement. I'm thrilled because we have an amazing group of students. So, uh, like I said, my goal is to have 100% of those students then roll into our social degree program. Um, that's not always going to happen, but we have many. So the great part of that is um, what we do is, is we do have high school juniors and seniors in our program. They come to school the next year, get their associate degree. And I know some of you are thinking, well, they're still too young to be hired. Um, a lot of agencies where I'm from in Wisconsin, you have to be, the Department of Justice in Wisconsin says 18, but most agencies in Wisconsin want you to be 21. So what we do is we've partnered with a local college to provide their bachelor's degrees here on our campus. So um, it's actually our instructors teaching it. So students who maybe weren't, maybe didn't think they could ever go on for their bachelor's or they're not quite ready to enter the workforce, um, our instructors are working for that four-year institution. Um, we're vetting all the curriculum to make sure it kind of builds upon what we're doing and it doesn't duplicate what we're doing. Um, it's in our building. Um, so that's been, that's a, a new initiative we're starting this year and we're excited about that. So um, one thing I would really say is that work with your local technical colleges. They are absolutely, should be your partners. They should be supplying you with um, great candidates. I know for us, um, we have 140 people on our staff and probably 90% of those are adjuncts um, that teach in our recruit academy. Um, we have, like I said, the dual enrollment. We have, uh, we do a ton of specialized training. We do in-service training. Um, we have our social degree program and we hire our local chiefs, captains, lieutenants, sheriffs to come teach. And then they use that as the recruiting tool. So they're in the classroom and they get kind of first kick at the cat for their candidates, which is great. I'm, I'm happy to do that. So, you know, my advice is definitely work with your local tech schools. They should be helping you um, recruit. But um, one, the other beauty of the dual enrollment program is that when they're here every day, like Sandra said, they're here Monday through Friday. Um, ours program is 830 to 1130 they're in the building with our recruit academy students so say they see the recruits um walking through the building and they see the recruits doing push-ups or getting pepper sprayed or tased or whatever they do that day um they see our northwestern staff and command class here and the leaders that are in the building uh, we might have a crisis negotiation class or we might have crowd control or whatever else we have going on they see it um and one thing we've changed in the last couple of years is our associate degree program we, we changed it because it was pretty myopic to just law enforcement. And we understand that a lot of these students aren't 
necessarily looking for just law enforcement. They're not necessarily looking to be in a squad car, but they want to be in the field. So we changed our program to be called um, criminal justice studies. So these students get jobs in um, maybe probation, parole, maybe corporate security. Um, we have students that have gone to the medical examiner's office. We have students that go to um, the district attorney's office. So quite a variety of uh, programs in um, in criminal justice. So we're grateful for this opportunity. Um, and we've seen students kind of unsure, um, just take it and run with it. We have one class called Careers in Public Safety. And every week they're exposed to a different area of uh, the criminal justice field. Um, and one minute they think they wanna be, you know, on canine or SWAT because um, that's what they've seen on TV. And then next thing you know, they're you know getting hired by the district attorney's office. So we expose them to a lot of areas that they maybe weren't familiar with or didn't even think of. So um, we're very, very fortunate to have a, a huge variety of um, adjunct instructors that teach for us that are you know more than willing to share their experiences. So um, I guess with that, I'd like to, Ron, if you're okay, open it up for questions. I see some questions coming in and I'd like to be able to to help uh, if people have any questions, understanding about how dual enrollment works or even how to work with their local technical colleges or community colleges, because that should be a great resource for every law enforcement agency. Uh, sure, thank, uh, thank you again, Jody. Uh, what, if you go to Q and A at the bottom of your screen, we're gonna field as many questions as we can. Once again, if we don't get to it by our time's up, uh, we'll be sending out an email blast in a day or two, and the instructors will be happy to, you'll have to see their email, they'll be happy to uh, continue with your questions. So we'll open it up to Q&A, and I'll try to get it, the questions to the right person. So I saw the first question that came through the chat, and it was about cost to students and funding source. So I can touch on that, and maybe Jody has a little bit more. But our dual enrollment academies, first of all, by state statute, we're not allowed to charge less than tuition. So the first thing that we do when we're putting a program together is look at what the tuition cost is. But then we also um, look at what our... Um, you know, the cost of just having the instructors and, and the supplies that are necessary. And so... Um, I, so the, the cost for the program is approximately, I want to say 5,000 ish dollars for the whole year. Um, but, and, and that is paid for by the school districts. Um, they just consider us an extension of their school. And if they can't offer this opportunity for students and the students want it, then they're willing to pay. Um, to have the students come here and get that education. I think there is specifically um, a cost to students as well um, that they cover. Uh, do you know what those are, Jody? Or did, did or did you guys cover all the costs? Like I'm thinking of the t-shirts and the yeah, physical exams. Had, um, just uniforms is the only additional cost that we had for them. Okay. And then as far as a funding source goes, so what we do when we start a new academy is we do look for grant funding. And we have gotten grant funding for new academies um, from various sources. So our technical, our state technical college system offers what's called a pathways grant. So when we start a new academy, we will typically write a pathways grant that will cover the cost of it for the first year, which is great because then the school districts can actually send students um, to the academies for the first year. And it's not even any cost to the school districts. We just roll that grant right into cost savings for our school districts, part of our partnership. Um, there's also um, in the state of Wisconsin, a department of workforce development. So you might wanna look to, um, to see if there's a workforce development opportunity out there. And then also at the federal level, level, there could be opportunities within the Department of Labor. But I would definitely, you know, research grant opportunities, especially when you're just rolling out a new academy. Uh, I do see a question here. Is, is there a questionnaire, a standard questionnaire that you use to interview your applicants? So I can answer that. Every program is different. And we chose specifically. Um, so I had my lead instructor on the interview panel. Um, I was on the panel. And then I chose a student currently in the program to be on the panel, too, to explain to the student what their day-to-day -day life. So I didn't have 
uh, we don't have standard standardized questions because the fire interviews are different from the child care interviews and every department does their own. So we just developed our own questions um, and did our interviews in our department. Okay. Uh, there is a question here says, how do you keep students engaged or interested in the career after graduation until they 21? I think you talked a little bit about that, but if you could go just maybe a little further. Yeah, that's exactly. So our goal is we're not just here to educate. Our goal is to get the students jobs. So we hook them up. We, we try to find internships. We do have internships in our, in our program. It's not uh, required for our degree, but we do have an internship um, that they can do. So if they want to try out, you know, we've had a student do a couple of different internships. So we try to keep them. Um, that's what this Lakeland opportunity is, is a, a, a local university that we're partnering with. So um, during that time, there is the, going to be that time frame that they're going to have um, if they graduate sooner and sooner, um, that gap before some agencies are going to want to hire them. So we just say, you know what, go on for your bachelor's um, or do some, you know, internships or some community service positions. Um, so we try to keep them, you know, engaged in the field. Um, but we have great relationships with our students. They're, you know, our instructors are friends and mentors lifelong. So we have constant communication. They're constantly come back and visiting, which is, is fantastic. So if we hear of a job opening or we know of something, um, we'll always uh, communicate back and forth. The, the other thing I wanted to mention too, is that those students, um, the dual enrollment students, what we do is say we're doing a a crowd control class and we need rioters or we're doing canine and we need people to do, you know, be um, um, role players or, or our tactical EMS. We use those students. So they get an idea. They get really excited. They love that. They get to see the other, the other side of things. Um, and the, the other thing I really try to do is when we have our open houses for the college, we do a couple open houses a year and just have people come and look and see our facilities, what we do. I really try to sell this to the parents um, as well, be, first of all, the parents love free year of college. Their ears certainly perk up for that. Um, but I tell them, look, if, if, and I tell the students too, this is not going to be what you normally think of college. You can't put your head on the table and fall asleep. You can't not show up to class. You can't not be prepared. Um, we're going to hold you to the rigor and the expectations of almost our police academy students. Um, so if they're looking for the senior slide, which like Sandra said, these students aren't typically looking for that because they've already put themselves out there. So um, we've had really good success. Once we explain to the, to the parents um, what this is about, they're just as eager as the students. Okay. Uh, one question I, I think I can answer it is they want to know specifically how they can reach out uh, for specific information. Again, an email will go to everyone with the three participants email address, and you can ask specific questions there. Uh, we do have a question though from, uh, asked about the students, uh, their past juvenile records, are there options for them in the field? Uh, how do you encourage students that have probably made mistakes uh, in the past to pursue opportunities in the field, counseling, other non-sworn, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. We get that even uh, students that apply for the police academy that don't meet the criteria for the state of Wisconsin. Um, so we certainly do have opportunities in our area for non-sworn positions. Um, and we do see that for students, maybe they made mistakes early and they come back, you know, later in, in uh, life, they've worked for years and they have it behind them and they have a, a, a record of, um, of good life decisions since that time. So, um, and we have agencies and not law enforcement specifically, but um, um, like I said, the um, the medical examiner's office we sent to or um, private industry, private security. Um, and they're happy to look at people that have, you know, have made mistakes and turn themselves around. And those people typically, you know, make good employees and hard workers. Okay. Um do you, I, I, I think I know the answer to this one, but do you hold law enforcement job fairs at the college? Um, so we don't do the, the fairs specifically just because our classes are so, um, they're really all over the place. We have day classes and evening classes. 
So what we do is we try to have agencies come in and talk to specific classes, come do recruiting. They do that a ton. They do it for community service positions. They do it for law enforcement positions. Um, they We will have agencies want to come talk to a recruit academy class. And I'll say, I'm sorry, all the recruits are hired. We don't have anyone looking for a job. And the agents will say, we don't care. We'll, hmm. we'll come talk to them anyway. So it's, I'm sure you all know, it's really dog eat dog out there. So we typically have them do one on one. I mean, I, I think a little more eyeball to eyeball. It has to be a little bit more um, personal. So, but they're happy to come in and, and talk to our students, and our doors are open at any time. Again, our goal is to get them jobs. So we will help them every step of the way. Okay. Uh, for uh, Lieutenant Durbin, for data collection, benchmarking, and goal setting, do you have templates or examples available? Uh, yeah, if you send me an email directly, I can respond and give you uh, some more specific examples. If there's something uh, that you're looking for specifically, just let me know and we can work like that offline. Okay. Uh, and then there was uh, another question here asked about uh, what success have you had in your placement service, uh, probably for the community college or technical college. Um, so the technical college does send out um, surveys to find out what job placement is. But what I found is that our statistics are actually better because a lot of those people don't respond. So there's no way of knowing. So we typically track our recruits. But like I said, most of what we have is the recruits calling their instructor who, again, was their friend and mentor and role model saying, I'm here, I got this job, or I don't, I'm no longer at that job. So um, and, and us working with the agencies to find out what jobs are open, what what's there. Um, so we we do get um, some information from the college, but a lot of that the students just don't respond to. So I wouldn't count that as as accurate um, because there's just it's a, a lack of response, and we get better communication one on one from the students directly. Okay. A uh, question for uh, Lieutenant Durbin, regarding, regarding female minority recruiting, what steps did you take to increase those numbers of applicants uh, other than representation in marketing? Yeah, so the State Patrol has taken a number of different steps. Uh, the, the doctoral study that I did uh, really focused on understanding some of the potential barriers for entry and for the state government and for the state police agencies, uh, specifically ours at the time, we had a number of very restrictive like protocols or just historic practices. Uh, one of those being when you came to the academy, you could not leave the academy. And that was a particular barrier if you're a female and you also have a family to take care of, you Monday through Friday couldn't leave. And mm -hmm. so, uh, in a lot of the findings that uh, that research provided and giving that back to the agency, some significant changes were made. So now if you're attending the academy and you're within a mileage to where it makes sense, you can leave and go home and take care of things as you need to. Um, but our academy, you're, you're locked in about four months out of a year, and then you go on your field training office uh, trip. And so you'll work more remotely closer to where your house is anyways. Um, but that was one example of a barrier that had an adverse impact specifically for females that wanted to, to join the patrol. Uh, and there, there's other examples, you know, state agencies uh, overall, when compared to local agencies, have a lower uh, rate for females and minorities. Uh, they average about 12% female, and most other agencies are in that 20% range. So there's just some um, challenges for a state agency that are different from other local agencies. Okay. Uh, I, I, I want to identify uh, as your, this is part of the technical college. Uh, your program is a great recruitment tool. Is this literally a grow your own model for other agencies to follow? It, it, absolutely. We, we, um, I don't know, Sandra, do you know, do other technical colleges in the state have a CJ dual enrollment program? Not that I'm aware of, but they tend to follow what we do. So <laughs> I'm sure that they're coming. Yeah. And that's fantastic. You know, the more, the better, the more students we can get into this, whatever part of the state they're in. So 
yeah, this is definitely my goal would be to have 100% of our students then roll into our associate degree program. Um, hopefully we can get them jobs if they're not job ready or young enough to get into law enforcement. Maybe we can guide them into that bachelor's program. Um, so yeah, we want to keep them. You know, my, like I always tell the recruits I graduated from the academy, I want you our next group of instructors. So, you know, do your time in law enforcement, get your experience, get some credentials under your belt, and then come back and teach. So let's continue this legacy of great training um, and great education. And, you know, you give back just to, to contribute back to what everyone else gave you. So um, I tell them the day they graduate, I said, I want to see you back here in a couple of years teaching for us. Um, and we're fortunate to have, you know, they do end up coming back. So yeah, we we grow them ourselves. We're, we're okay with that though. Okay. Uh, I have one question here. I'm not sure where to direct it, so I'll just say it. Uh, do you have a talking uh, or summary paper we can use as a roadmap? My sense is that would be in the technical colleges uh, area, but is there something there or a summary paper? Um, you know what might help is the document that Sandra showed before. Um, it's, I think that's pretty interesting, and that would be something great to show your technical colleges. One thing I wanted to mention is in our um, in our program, you know, every the last couple of years we've done it, we look at it, we change, we modify it, we make it better. What we learned is last year, um, what the one of the biggest stumbling blocks for all of the students was math. So we actually took math out. They're going to have to take math later on, but um, the high school students were not were not interested. As I know, many law enforcement people aren't. They're not interested in math. So we took that out. We want it to just still be fun for them. They can do that. They can do that later. So, um, and when I mentioned that to the student as a potential improvement for next year, they all nodded in agreement. So, um, so I think we put together a great, a great first year to really get their feet wet. They they love that, and everybody teaching in that are um, officers that are either recently retired uh, assistant chiefs. Uh, captains, lieutenants, um, and, you know, they come directly from work and they come teach. So it's everybody either recently out of the field or in the field that teach those classes. So I put in the chat a link to uh, the website, the Dual Enrollment Academy website. So you'll see on that a link to the criminal justice flyer. The one that I showed is the current one. The one that's still on our website is last year's that it also that still has math in it. Um, but it, it'll give you an idea of all the academies we have. Most of the courses, uh, besides the math one uh, that was replaced, I think, with juvenile law. Um, and then it'll also show like the timeline for recruiting the students. Something else that I wanted to mention about, you know, kind of along the grow your own thing when you're when you're thinking younger is utilizing the school resource officers at the high schools to encourage students down this path as well. We have one of our larger school districts who is very passionate about it, um, exposing the criminal justice career field to students in high school. And he even, and I don't know if he's actually done this, but he was talking about, so maybe he has kind of like starting a club where the students, you know, meet regularly, talk, you know, and talk about career options and actually have kind of like boot camp um, physical fitness type of activities even before school starts so and then he will direct them to the dual enrollment academy if if they want to continue to pursue it so really making those connections at the high school level with the sros can be helpful as well okay um i see a question here i was wondering about law enforcement applicants i'm guessing these are police officers that would like to take advantage of these credits this would be probably for Jody or Sandra. In other words, if I understand this question correctly, can a police officer enroll in this program or is this strictly high school students? I think I know the answer, but. The academy itself is strictly high school okay. students. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question would be uh, for Sandra and Jody. I know your program is in its infancy. However, have you noticed your overall applicant numbers going back up or is it too soon to gauge its success? Yeah, we definitely had uh, word of mouth was definitely helpful to us this year because the students in the program went back to the high schools and talked about it. Um, very often when we did the interviews, we would ask, how did you hear about this? And it was from a student currently enrolled in the program. So that has been 
significantly uh, beneficial just to students talk about it. Um, and then the students also would come and say, hey, my friend so-and-so applied, um, they'd be fantastic. Or my friend so-and-so applied, they're not going to take it seriously. So we want students that are going to finish out the year, take it seriously, because they're they're taking a spot away from someone who may take it seriously. So we really try to vet them and make sure. Um, it, it, to piggyback on that a little bit, talking about our, so we also have the associate degree, the criminal justice studies associate degree, and we had been taking a hit um, for the last couple of years, as I think, you know, you've seen less um, applicants, we saw less students, but we're definitely seeing uh, an uptick on that. I have several classes in my, my fall semester that are full at capacity. Um, so that's fantastic. So I'm hoping we're seeing a turnaround um, in the profession and more and more people attracted. And I have to say the students that I'm seeing are dedicated and fantastic. Um, and we we have our next two and a half years worth of police academy schedule set up and out there for agencies. And they're all full. Our next two and a half years of academies are full. So um, there's interest out there. Agencies are hiring. Um, we're very blessed in Wisconsin to have great agencies, especially in this part of the state. So um, I'm, I think I'm hoping we bottomed out and we're we're inching back up. Um, you know, I have unbelievable instructors at work here. So that's I think that's uh, part of it is I have everybody is kind of our um, marketing tool. So something else that I wanted to mention, too about the academy, about this particular criminal justice academy is typically when we start a new academy, it starts out a little slow because not everybody, you know, that word of mouth hasn't gotten out there about that particular academy. And like Jody said, they're here in the morning, they go back to their high school in the afternoon and they're telling their friends what they did in the morning um, while their friends were sitting in math and English class. So that really builds up academies over time. Um, which is why it's really beneficial to start with a grant because you may not have enough students to cover the cost of that academy from the get-go. Um, however, with criminal justice, it was different. Our first year, we had more applications than we had spots for from the get-go, and that's highly unusual. So the interest is out there with the high school population. They just don't know how to get into it. So when that pathway is opened up for them, that door is opened for them, it seems like they, they come in droves. Hmm. Uh, one more, uh, Lieutenant Durbin, in your work or in your department, I'm not sure. Uh, do you have a questionnaire that you use to interview applicants to determine why they are interested in law enforcement and why you are interested in our department, et cetera? Yeah, um, so my doctoral study project is published, and I, if you reach out to me, I can share it with you, and I have all of the questionnaires uh, that were used in that study, so you can see every question that was asked to not only the focus groups, but every candidate, so that would be more than happy to share that. Okay, I'm going to give it about five seconds. I think we got through all the questions. We're just about out of time. Uh, if you have a question, pop it to us before we before we call it a day. Uh, there is a question, Lieutenant German, about your email address. We will send that out in the e-blast uh, that will go out in a day or two. I know that uh, uh, Sanders responded to the group already with hers, but we'll include everyone's email address for uh, specific uh, deals. Now, I'm, I'm gonna read one thing here. Many departments are faced with budget restrictions as well as limited staffing. With those two things in mind, creating programs, staffing, covering overtime costs, with those programs targeting juveniles and those 18 to 20 become difficult, how does an agency increase qualified applicants uh, numbers specifically locally without simply offering giant sign-on bonuses or pay increases? Uh, by Lieutenant Durbin, uh, but like other agencies are seeing lower applicant numbers, our data doesn't support a single answer to fix this. How does an agency get a, a rise in applicant numbers needed to sustain staffing? So there's kind of a few questions in that. Right. Uh, I'll kind of break it apart. I would say right. one thing that the Washington State Patrol has done to reach that younger demographic is to change the hiring age. So we were an agency uh, several years ago that hired at 21. We've lowered that to 19 and a half. And with the 
hopes that you are getting that younger candidate locked in to a career uh, at a younger age. And so at the 19 and a half, they may not have other opportunities to get a job that's going to be paying what we pay, even though that's not the same level as a commissioned officer, but they, they get into the academy at a younger age the, by the time they graduate and become a commission officer they'll be 21 um, but that kind of locks them in as a as an applicant um the rest of the question if you can uh remind me again that ron sure uh it just says that it says how does they increase qualified applicant numbers specifically locally without offering the giant bonuses and pay increases yeah that, that's interesting and if you do some research um I think what you're going to find is a lot of these agencies that are offering the huge sign-on bonus, they're not having the reaction and the, the impact that, that you might think that they are. And mm -hmm. I think it really comes down to messaging is your, your message for why somebody wants to join your uh, specific agency. It really comes down to what's the culture of your agency? What are you messaging to applicants? Uh, here in Washington State is a great example. There's some departments that are offering 50, 60, $70,000 sign-on bonus. They can't get applicants. Yet other agencies that offer zero bonus are completely filled. They have 100% um, filled agencies. And why is that? Well, when you go and you spend time asking or talking to the candidates, what you're going to find is that their messaging uh, is something that connected with the applicant. What they see in the department, what the culture of the department is, is what they were looking for. Um, so you have to identify that's where like actually interviewing each candidate to ask, you know, why did you apply for this agency and just as valuable, why aren't you if, if you are going to like in Washington State, there's uh, something called public safety testing. So if you're interested in testing with an agency, you're going to test um, basically for all law enforcement and you can click a box on which agencies you actually want to apply for. If you attend those hiring events uh, or testing events you can have opportunities to speak to those candidates and find out, hey, why didn't you uh, add our agency to this? That can be just as telling, if not more, to what is the perception of your agency. And that's what you've got to really focus on and change. And you can change that through, you know, what technology your agency and department uses, what, you know, the level of professionalism is or how it's perceived. And if it's low, that's where the marketing message needs to come in and change so that you can change the agency, the external perspective, you need to change it from within. And you have, it has to be actual change. You can't just give a lip service because they will know. They're going to go talk to other officers in that department to see, is this a department you want to work for? So your, your own internal people will be your biggest advocate or they might be your biggest deterrent for people wanting to join. Uh, last comment, it says we, we uh, target local school programs and college programs that offer CJ programs, et cetera but still those aren't turning out the numbers we need. Uh, probably for Jody and Sandra, uh, that would be a, maybe just a couple of minutes of commercial time to, how do you, how do, you do this? Yeah, well, one thing I would mention is try to, try to work there, try to infiltrate the system and get the students when they're still students. Um, again, many of our instructors uh, work for the local agencies and they do recruiting while they're there teaching. And you know what, again, our goal is to get students the jobs they want. Um, and so I have, I have no problem with that at all. I'm glad to, to hire people that want to hire our students. That's the whole goal. Okay. Uh, well, I have to be the bad guy. Our time is up, but I would, first of all, just two things. Uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you so much for our panelists and presenters. Excellent. Uh, and uh, to those that, that tuned in with this, I want to thank you for that. To our ambassadors who worked so hard to put this together for us. And uh, again, I wish you all the best. And we look forward.